Welcome to Because You Need to Know. I'm Edwin K. Morse, President and Founder of Pioneer Knowledge Services. This series is your digital resource of valuable conversations with nonprofit and knowledge management enthusiasts from across industries and from around the globe. My name is Amit Tanaja. I work in the field of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, but my calling is to create a gentler, kinder, and loving world. I currently work at Chautauqua Institution as the inaugural Senior Vice President and Chief IDEA Officer, that's Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility. I recently wrote a self-paced guidebook titled How to Write an Anti-Racism Action Plan. The topic I can talk for hours is techno music. I envision a future where we all get along and respect one another. Wow, that's a simple and direct want right there. What a, what a desire. Well, that last piece you just brought out about yourself, where does that come from in you? Where did you get that onus to say, this is important? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think if you look at the state of our country, of our world right now, it takes the smallest amount of provocation or even lack of provocation for folks to retreat into their own tribes, so to say, right? And what tribes do is they defend uh, themselves from outsiders. They view other tribes as oppositional, as in competition, as somebody to be suspicious of. And, you know, I think there's a certain amount of sadness to live in a society where we can't figure out a way to be in community with one another as opposed to have this sort of uh, us versus them mindset. It seems that, uh, I can't think of the author, but the book was... Uh... Lord of the Flies. Yeah. It is it is a behavior study and really the tribalism of mm -hmm. just how the human framework kind of backs up to a certain level as mm -hmm. basic as that is. You know, as you said, you know, you're kind of in this defend mm -hmm. position and you are viewing anything from an external as somewhat as a, as a threat. So how does an organization engage... Mm -hmm their people differently to elevate them to a different paradigm? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So I think part of it is helping people understand that our former ways of doing things are just not working, right? Uh, it's kind of like we keep talking about racism or sexism or ableism, all those kinds of things. And our strategies to address those issues have not really evolved or changed. So part of it is just owning up and saying what we've been doing is not working, so we got to do something different. So that's one piece. The second piece of it is having organizational ownership from the top down and bottom up to say this is creating a more inclusive, diverse, equitable, and accessible organization is an organizational commitment. And if we move in that direction, then we really have to build this work in the reward and evaluation structures of the job. So for example, you know, could we imagine a world in which the CEO of Staples says that selling paper is the most important thing that we do as a company, but there is not a single question in employee evaluations that says, how much paper did you sell, right? <laughs> but that's the, yeah, that's the weird parallel that we have right now that no matter which CEO that you look at, you know, they'll have diversity statements and say diversity is most so important to our business, to our nonprofit, to our organization. And yet nothing in the employee evaluation sends the message that everyone has a part to play. So you're right. So where does it start? If you've got an organization that's fresh to this mm -hmm. concept, let's say that mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. not Sure. And I, I'm glad you brought up, you started your handout to author a way of helping organizations help figure this mm -hmm. out because it is a lot of muddy water at this point. Sure. Don't you find that people just resort back to whatever their background is to a lot of these things, which is not healthy mm -hmm. in and of itself to some degree, that you've got to have a, like you said, a, a cohesive way that the organization represents itself but also mm -hmm. the interactivity of how do you gauge success? Like you said, if you just throw out the labels of, okay, yeah, we got a policy on that, mm -hmm. but there's no oomph behind it. Yeah. There's no anybody taking care of that or checking or mm -hmm. how do you start to gauge progress? Mm -hmm. I assume building a baseline is pretty easy. Well, we don't have any of this, so we're 
we're starting at zero. Sure. How do you set yourself up for organizational success? Organizations that are really interested in doing this work, first of all, I think philosophically, they need to understand the moral and ethical imperative to do IDEA work, but there are also other pressing concerns, right? So it might be a legal imperative, but even more so the business imperative, right? So if we think about the demographics of the United States and the pretty significant shifts that we expect to see over the next two decades, if you are not doing the work right now to become a more inclusive workplace, a more inclusive organization, a lot of those places are gonna be in deep trouble 10, 15, 20 years down the road. And if that's when they start doing the work, they're gonna be miles and miles you know, behind. So a lot of times I think people get the ethical, moral, or legal imperative, which is important, but you gotta be able to make the business case for why doing this work makes sense. How do you draw the lines for everybody to color the picture in? How do you, how do you format what an organization should be doing in any of those sectors. Is, is it safe to say equality? Is, just, is that a rubric to say that that kind of couches everything you do is, in a way, you're bringing up everybody equally? Yeah, equality is maybe not the right frame. Equity is the better frame. So an equality mm. perspective would say that everybody has a physical chair around a table. Equity says that you have chairs around the table, but you also have places for people to stand, for somebody to come in with a wheelchair. You know, um, equality is probably what resonates with us as individuals, right? We want everybody to be treated the same, but we have to recognize that different people will have different needs coming to the table itself. I like that because you're, you're talking about a buffet of opportunity. You're just basically mm -hmm. saying, everybody come as you are and we'll make do. Yeah, and the idea behind that is that, you know, a lot of places popularize the idea of we need to confront our unconscious biases, right? So there's a lot of emphasis in trying to understand the basic assumptions we might make and which how we read situations. But I think, you know, it's time for us to move past that conversation of unconscious bias and really have a more targeted conversation around how do we create conscious inclusion? Thinking ahead of time, who's coming, who's not coming, more importantly, why are they not here? What voices are missing from our table? There's tons and tons of research, particularly in the business world, right, that says that having more diverse teams leads to much, much better outcomes, right? So again, that a power company was having to spend hundreds and thousands of dollars getting snow off of power lines. So they did um, basically a, a brainstorm session to solve that problem and try to do a cost analysis of like, if we don't want power to be down for so long, we have to buy like 300 trucks and we need to hire certain number of people because they were thinking in a very linear fashion, right? Somebody's going to go out and literally broom or clean the, the power lines um, so that they don't get weighed down by snow. And it so happened, at least the story goes, that one of the administrative assistants surrounded in a room of engineers was taking notes and said, well, what if we just got a helicopter to fly over? The air will just basically knock all the snow off, which was a much cheaper, much quicker option, right? Again, somebody who may not have the the same perspective as all you know these engineers <laughs> in the room was able to solve a problem that was cheaper quicker more efficient right so that's just it's a small example but it speaks to the importance of having diverse members diverse perspectives present in teams well not only the engagement or the representation of everybody on the team so to speak but the opportunity to have a voice to have right. Uh, authority, not maybe not even authority, but just to have space mm -hmm. that everybody is is welcome with a with a clue here. You don't have to be in that case an engineer. You don't mm -hmm. have to be anything. You just mm -hmm. you can listen and give us some feedback or ideas. Mm -hmm. And not every environment welcomes that. Absolutely. And so you know, part of doing IDEA work is managing the pull between tradition and innovation. In a number of ways, tradition provides institutions the stability they need in order to survive difficult times, sometimes even to grow, right? But 
as we start to create spaces for new voices to be at the table and the decision making, if we are too tied with that sense of tradition or you know the common phrase of we don't do it this way here or we have always done it that way, that to me is always right. like you know a little bit of a uh, red flag that okay that, yeah red yeah. flag yeah, yeah exactly who's doing this better hmm. who's performing well in this space is it non for profits is it business uh, for profit is it small big medium multinationals who's doing this well. It's it's kind of hard to answer that question because I think in different industries, there may be different focal points, right? So in the business world, a lot of folks are trying, everybody's trying to get a bigger market share, so to say. Some institutions have done this work better than others. I would say in generally, the ones that are really committed don't just put out a diversity statement, which is all about values, which is great, right? I'm going to make fun of myself here for a second. Like I know... <laughs> that going to the gym is really good for my physical and mental health. So that's a good value to have, but does that mean I get up every morning and go to the gym? No. So a lot of places have put these statements out and they think, and often these statements come in the aftermath of a national tragedy like George Floyd, and then they just sit on a website or they sit on some kind of a statement. So the people who are doing it well are writing action plans to make their organizations more inclusive. They set metrics, they invest resources, because again, they not only believe in the ethical and moral imperative, but also the business imperative of committing to this work. They have to assign somebody that's pulling the weight, right? Somebody that's got the, mm -hmm. you know, hey, let's go <laughs> this way. Is that a tough sell? Do you think it's easy to placate? It's yeah. easy to throw out a little paragraph. Yep, we believe in all this stuff and then do mm -hmm. absolutely nothing to address the culture. Yeah, and I think institutions that just put out statements and no actions, right? Long-term becomes even more problematic because communities, whether it be their employees or their customers, they see that as a disconnect between what you say and what you do. Right. The other thing I would say is there is a growing need in many different sectors where leaders are recognizing that they need experts to lead them through the process of culture change, because that's really what this is about. Right. Partly helping the institutional culture to evolve so that every employee or every customer feels fully welcome and somebody who can navigate all those challenges. So generally speaking, I would say that people with that expertise come with that change management mindset as opposed to the, the whip mindset, right? They're much more carrot than, than stick. What you get from the stick metaphor is short-term compliance but not long-term change of hearts and minds, right? And that ultimately is the goal, is changing hearts and minds, changing our policies and practices, the willingness to critique, even in some cases, what we're not doing well, right? The willingness to ask hard questions. So I'm not saying that the work is easy or that you don't hold people accountable where they may be falling short, but it's more teaching them how to do incorporate inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility in the work that they do. It's not an add-on, but it's helping them think about their work a little bit differently. Well, and also I would have to assume that you're giving them new pathways of different behaviors. You're giving them mm -hmm. an opportunity to engage mm -hmm. the workplace and maybe just themselves as a human on a planet in a different way to, to learn something different. How much of this work is built around training and education and or mm -hmm. imparting learning on the employees? Yeah, it's a good question. A couple of things, you know, everybody goes to training as the be all end all cure to all of these issues. But I would contend that diversity is not an ill for which a training becomes uphill, right? And then we're all done. There is no such thing as a two hour diversity training that will fix all of our society's issues. So part of it is how do we create spaces for ongoing conversations and the ability to take a step back again and look at what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And what unintended consequences it may have to exclude people. So that's one way in which I would answer that question. The second way is it's not work that comes easy to a lot of folks because it has not been expected of them. 
if I use the analogy of learning how to run a marathon, first, you know, as babies, we have to learn how to crawl, then you learn how to stand, then you wobble, then you walk, then you run, then you sprint, and then you become a marathoner. It's not an overnight thing. I have some empathy for folks who have never done this work, right, in that they may have the right intention, but if I come in and say, you've never crawled, but I want you to run a marathon six months from now, it's not a reasonable expectation. So part of it is, you know, to have a long-term strategy, right? The next six months, you're learning how to crawl. Next six months, you're learning how to walk. And that's not putting the problem off for decades or decades or decades, right? It could be that maybe two, three, four-year ramp-up period to give people the confidence, the skills, the fire within. Yeah. This is about lighting the fire within. How do you roll that out with the anticipation of a more aware mm -hmm. foundation in your people? Mm -hmm. I, I presume it's dualistic in that you have to address the present people and then you have to build a better onboarding process to mm -hmm. have that there when they get there so they mm -hmm. already know that. Does that mean that this type of language is in everybody's job description, just like any other performance of an organization where you've got individual performance measures? Mm -hmm. Is this another way to either encourage or discourage behavior? And, you know, so if we go back to the original proposition that we're building this into the organization's overall work or strategic plans, which is the case for my current employer, it's one of many other measures, right? So we we have five different strategic initiatives and IDEA is one of those. To only highlight that would maybe be a little off, right? But when I think about performance evaluations, we say, here's the institution strategic plans, you know, tell us, did you do anything for objective one, for objective two, right? And if IDEA is one of those objectives, then it makes, I think, again, a little bit more sense and will not, given, again, the current state of our country's discourse, will not turn into, oh, here's another politically correct thing that you know the institution is doing, but really define it as a business imperative of why we're doing this. What's the biggest challenge right now? Um, any kind of work that happens in this IDEA space automatically gets politicized right away. The camp or tribal mentality that I referenced earlier is so strong that we have little to no willingness to hear an opinion that's different than our own. And I think this exists for all political spectrums, that this work gets very political very quickly, gets very emotionally charged. And we have to layer the sense of urgency there because historically marginalized communities have been told over and over again, wait for the time, wait for the time. Change is hard. Change is going to take some time. People are very quick to quote Martin Luther King. <laughs> so we're about 50 plus years out after his death, and yet we're still waiting for that change if you look at the larger societal outcomes. So that that's probably the biggest challenge, that people are so enmeshed in what they already believe that the ability to hear a different perspective becomes very, very difficult. Everything's challenged. Everything is just mm -hmm. challenged. You know, there's this gut position of, oh, I'm not doing that. It, it's like a light mm -hmm. switch. And, and instead of having different levels of gray, you've just got black mm -hmm. and white and it's ridiculous. I mean, where else does that work? Where else does that even <laughs> work? It really doesn't, but I want to build on this just a little bit. Sure. The, the other part of the challenge is that many organizations and many people feel that their doors are open, right? We're not stopping any people who are different than us to come and work here or to come to our store or engage with our business or nonprofit, right? So the problem is always in some ways situated on those that are not engaging with them, right? And part of the different frame of reference is to say, is there something that we are doing that is intentionally or unintentionally sending the message that you don't belong here, right? And sometimes it may not even be an intentional thing. It may be something even more broader than what your company may or may not be doing. If you didn't get a chance to see this, Saturday Night Live did this amazing skit on an Amazon Go store where the white customers are like, great, I'm going to pick stuff off the shelf and just walk right out. And then they had a series of people of color be like, 
okay, now where do I pay? Like, I'm not leaving this store. And that had such resonance for me. I'm like, yeah, I'm never stepping into right. an Amazon Go store. Yeah, that's... I already know what it feels like to be surveilled, to be trailed, to be treated like somebody yeah. who's going to steal from a store that I cannot imagine how uncomfortable I would be <laughs> in that space. So it's exactly that kind yeah. of thing. Too bad we don't have that automatic response to white collar crime. So it's interesting how it's a class system. It, it ends up being a class system and a class representation. And that's how people consciously or unconsciously it's not just race. Uh, it's it's a lot of things, right? It's, it's a lot of all things. rolled up into an ugly ball of, of junk that if you don't start picking it apart and see what all is in that ball, you're never going to have that self-awareness and the ability to change. So mm -hmm. even on the individual level, just not even talking about an organization, but just individually, how do you start peeling apart? And there's got to be a desire for change mm -hmm. first and foremost. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a reason that says, all right, this isn't working for me anymore. Mm -hmm. Time to evolve. In the world of evolving organizations, is there a metric in the world of international standards? There are mm -hmm. metrics that mm -hmm. give an organization a score. Is there a organization that goes around mm -hmm. doing that evaluation for what you're doing now? There are a few folks who have developed inventories. So one of them is the IDI, the Intercultural Development Inventory. And it basically helps people understand where on the scale of new to an expert level are you around diversity and inclusion and where you might grow, what the next step might look like. So it's kind of a guided tool, a kind of a self-assessment that so you can understand your own where you're at. But then they also extend that to teams, right? If everybody in, in my VP's division, let's say, took that, we can say, you know, on a scale of one to seven, we're at about a three and a half. So where we need to go is a four collectively, right? right. So there are places that do that. I think those kinds of things can be helpful. But you know, if we go back to understanding why this work is important, a lot of time and energy can go into a little bit of navel gazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is, you know, if, if everybody doesn't know, that's an academic term. That is, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's just the looking inwards. Let me think about me and my, yes, myself. Yes. But the challenge again there is that you're putting yourself at the center. And what we need to do is put those who are not present, who are not coming, is try to understand their perspective. Part of good knowledge management then is knowing how to ask really difficult questions to get to answers, to hold up a mirror sometimes and get answers that are gonna make us very uncomfortable. I like that. If you're not well to look in the mirror, then you gotta wonder why are you here? Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not a fit for yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Because You Need to Know is designed to bring people's experience and their knowledge forward to be shared. I'm Edwin K. Morris, and I thank you for joining in to listen to another conversation brought to you as a public service of Pioneer Knowledge Services, a nonprofit tax exempt organization with a charitable knowledge management purpose. Find us online at pioneer ks.org and add your voice to the conversation on Facebook.